But it's Paging's perfect. Lovely. And we sat here, a couple of Pisces with some tea and some water. <laughs> yes. I think this is quite a good rainy International Women's Day, don't you? It is. It is. And yeah. very all liquid based for this for these Pisces. This is, <laughs> it's all coming together, Freema. Yeah. It's like, it's like we planned it. And speaking of International Women's Day, yeah. Freema, answer me this. What woman, dead or alive, do you most admire? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a huge one. Do you want to have a think about it? We'll move on. We'll go on to something well, different. These are just little warm-up things. They, they can answer. They, they can be a big answer. They can be a small answer. Well, that's answer. the thing, isn't it? Because it could be... I could go very, you know, deeply political and, you know, people who move needles and change landscapes. Or I could be like, you know, <laughs> something very light and poppy that makes makes me smile. It's sort of, you know, what I don't... That is a hard one. It is a hard one. I'll I'll come back to All it right, and I'll then. ask you, a good film or a good book? A good book. What's, what have you been reading at the moment? Well, I'm guilty of owning a Kindle, that's something to be guilty for, but, but the, the, the point is... I have about five books open all at once. And I knew that would happen when I bought the Kindle. Mm -hmm. I actually prefer a hard copy, mm -hmm. beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I like the look of it, of a book, the smell of a book, the the decoration that it gives you for free in Going your house. Going into the bookshop is an absolute oh, treat. Oh, my God. My brother just said that to me the other day. He went, I've just discovered going to bookshops with his um, fiance. They just spent, I was like, yeah, it's just a thing to do. So, um. I love that. But then I was like, I need a Kindle for, you know, at the gym and stuff. You want to put it down yeah, yeah, on yeah. the beach, sticky fingers and wet seaness. Um, yeah, the Kindle's going to be better. But I thought, don't download and open more than one book at a time. And there's just loads on there. They range between self-help, <clears throat> fiction, um, uh, all sorts. But I'm, I think I'm going to just be stricter yeah. with completing one. It's interesting you say, I find it very difficult on a Kindle for, for, the, for the reasons that you just said, but also turning the page. Oh, no. The physical act of turning the page. And also, I get a call from the kitchen, I get a call from my son, the folding over. Oh. I mean, I say that, I'm never sat down reading a book when my son's around, because that is <laughs> as if I have that, you know, <laughs> glorious time for myself. Folding that page over. Folding. Have you not a bookmark, bookmark man, then? No, I'm not a bookmark no. man. No, I probably should be, shouldn't I? Is that, is, am I disrespecting the book? No, 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 no. No, I mean, I might be disrespecting, I'm, I might be guilty of underlining. I used, pe I Instagrammed a picture once, and I had obviously had this passage in a book, and I had written in the margin and and people like do not write in books and no. i was like oh man no actually no, <laughs> I, I think you should like I, if there's I, something I, there yeah. that that speaks to you or sings to you or you learn something or there's there's I don't know, a fact that you didn't know i definitely highlight that of course i did that with a brian grazer book a few years ago and it's still there on my bookshelf it's fantastic it's nice. but i find that with like with our work as well if you know, and I'm all about, you know, reducing paper and there's so much waste, right. I understand. But if I get a script, I find it very, very difficult to read and certainly impossible to learn lines if it's on the iPad. I agree. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe it's just because I'm soon to be 40 <laughs> and maybe that's <laughs> of a certain age. I don't know. No, I agree. I've tried. I'll look at it online and then just... I'm not, I'm a bit of a Luddite, so I do see people with their iPads with the pen that mm -hmm. mark a thing. I wouldn't even know where to begin. No. So I'm just like, no, no, just scroll. Impossible. But I was on a job where they printed um, the sides out A5. So you're getting half of it. I mean, yeah. not that, sorry, not the, the sides you always get A5, but you're getting your, your scripts mm. were reduced. Well, that's why I've got, I've got these, because it got to a point where I was looking at scripts. I was going, I can't, can't. I can't read that. My eyes okay. are going... <laughs> and, and, if I, and if I but if I can't read I can't do my job um, tell me city shopping or a country stroll country stroll All that's the easiest long. one that I've done so far <laughs> we're at the theatre Freema you're not enjoying it do you walk out of the interval or do you see it through it's something that's come up and I only say that because I, I, I have a very strong opinion 
on this question. Well, I'm, well then we're probably going to... I hope we agree, but we probably won't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because you, 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 you won't kick me out. No. Um, it's the same with a book... Um, which I was going to mention earlier, even if I'm not enjoying it, I have to finish it. Mm. I know uh, that's sort of a waste of precious life. But then I think to myself, that con- you know, that completist in me kind of goes, I've started, so I'll finish. No, I, like, I have to draw a line under this. Yeah, I have I to read the whole thing and say, I didn't enjoy this. I gave it every chance. I finished it. And um, so I would sit through. <laughs> no. This is interesting. Uh, would you say you're a better host or a better guest? Interpret that as you will. Interpret that. That's like um, saying driver or passenger, isn't it? That's funny. That's my next. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guest. Yeah. Because I, I will invariably kind of go and ask the host if they need any help. I would want to act like the host without the responsibility of... Being or, the host. Or, or, the, or the pressure. Or the pressure. I was talking to somebody, again, at the, the birthday party that I went to on Saturday night, and it, it, he was so happy that people were there. Yeah. But he said the weeks leading up to it, he was terrified that no one was going to show. It wasn't a big party by any means, but everybody was there. And the relief that everybody said, I said, never again. There's a reason why I've <laughs> never had a birthday party before. I just cannot handle this <laughs> this pressure leading up to it. I know what you mean. All right, maybe we'll dive into birthdays a bit later. <laughs> what is it that you... And I don't want this to be negative, although it sounds like a negative question. Um, what is it that you most dislike? That I most dislike? Mm. Intolerance. Um, people being rude (laughs) and unkind. Any kind of lack of empathy, really, really gets me. That is the correct answer. Well done. (laughs) You have won. Saturday night or Sunday morning, Freema? Saturday night! (laughs) (laughs) Has it always been a Saturday night? Oh, I love a party. I love a party. I just do. And and we talked about our birthdays coming up and about planning things. I plan them and I they extend about two weeks long. Really? And I want to make memory after memory and celebrate with people I love repeatedly. Someone said to me once, Oh no, people who like birthdays, it's only because it's coming from like an egotistical place. They want all the attention on them, all the energy. And I was like, oh, that's that's not the way I perceived it at all. I kind of felt like mm, the next month, the next week, the next hour is not guaranteed. I'd quite like to celebrate. Another soda revolution. And, and also bring people together. So In and around with yeah. people that I love and get nourished by and energised by. And we can just enjoy good food and good chat and good drinks and, and sing and dance and really just express some gratitude for being here is how I see it. So, um, and I don't care about ageing, I think as well. I'm not speaking for people who don't like birthdays, but that often comes up. Mm-hmm. Don't want to talk about my, don't acknowledge I'm getting older, don't want to talk about ageing. Well, we're all headed in one direction. Um, and I think that the the benefits of ageing, the wisdom and the, the life experience that we get in exchange for get, being another year older, I just think is, is sublime. Um, but I, so anyway, love it, love it. Anywhere where I have... Um, so in my apartment when I was living in New York and anywhere that I consider home, there's always a bar and people come around and go, and I'm not saying a party equals drink. However, I would always make sure I have a well-stocked bar. Again, it's not just for me, it's for other people. <laughs> it's for other people. Because someone's like, what is that? Why is there so much? I said, I always like the idea that there's a potential for a party at any second. And we all know that the best part is... Are the impromptu parties the impromptu that parties. just happen? Yeah, yeah. 
It's one, two, ten people around. You know, there's something happened. Like, you know, your kid got a brilliant grade at school or, or I don't know, your team won something. It's just, there's always something. Or you've just had a minor or major win in whatever level in your life. Just come on, man. There's too many things to be happy for. How long are you in New York for? Four years. Overall, six, but consecutively four. I did six months. I found it very... I mean, I loved it. Don't get me wrong, but what a city, what could be... I saw that it could be a very unforgiving city. But what a buzz. Did you have a good time? That's so accurate. It's like a mirror. And it, whatever you're feeling, it will bounce that back mm. at you. Mm. And because it can make you feel overwhelmed and, you know... I don't know, just there's a lot There's a lot of energy and I feel like if you go out feeling like you're about to be squashed, oh. you will get squashed. There's a lot of energy, <laughs> yes, yeah. There's a lot. And I had to find, I feel like the way it worked for me is I had to find my hood, my tribe, my rhythm. Because if you try, because it's, a, you know, it's relatively small enough, you can feel like there's always something going on over there and over here and over there. You're just trying to be on the pulse of everything. And it's exhausting and overwhelming. And I found I had to streamline that and find a neighborhood and a way of life. And then it becomes, you know, manageable. Yeah. And, um, and I really enjoyed it. So I went, I actually went from Manhattan to, to Brooklyn and um, found a little area that I loved and and um yeah but before then I was a bit like whoa this is high octane yeah it's full on I mean you say that about you know going in with the right finding the right energy finding the right tribe that's like what we did at school anyway because you go right where do I fit in here who is gonna listen to me who can I listen to who can I learn off who can I be accepted by who's gonna accept me so true it's the same right or places of work Uh uh-huh I mean, we're constantly, anyway. we're constantly doing that, aren't we? Constantly. I mean, now, I've, you know, been doing it quite a long time. And for every new job, for every new start of school, you hope, really hope, that if there's, generally there's somebody on the cast list that you've worked before and that's great, right? Yeah. And then you go, if there's somebody behind the camera that I've worked with before or somebody in the sound department and we've got a shorthand, that oh, that's, makes me a bit more comfortable. I'm a little bit less nervous, a little so bit less, less anxious. So true. Do you find that? That's 100% true. Yeah. And that's, again, another beauty of of experience and and, and you know, getting on further and further in life and in your career, that that kind of... that. That having, you know, a, a bigger network of people that you know increases the the odds of you knowing someone on each new job that you go on. Yeah. So I have found that definitely that as time has gone on, I can pretty much be reassured of the fact that there's going to be a familiar, friendly face there. Mm. Um, and then that gives you the confidence then to then, I don't know, go out and try and make new friends. But I was having this conversation with someone the other day. And I was like, as an adult, how do you say to someone, do you want to be friends? Mm. <laughs> So much easier when we were kids. I was, oh I was my God. talking to the days with friend. You know, we uh, stop playing in a way when we sort of find sex and we go, oh, well, this is this new thing now. So therefore, I need to be grown up and I need, I'm <laughs> completely self conscious about my body. I can't be, just be free yeah. and go and jump naked on the trampoline like oh. I used to do. Right. See, that sounds like a party right there That's, as well. I mean, we, don't, we don't talk about that party, Freeman. I'm just going to say I was never convicted for anything. Oh my God. <laughs> just, just for anybody listening, uh, that was just a little joke. <laughs> you mentioned before about um, New York and you said the word home wherever my home is. Are you, do you find it easy bouncing around wherever you are to go, right, I'm here now for the X amount of time, I'm going to make this my home, or this is just my base for the next job? Because it is tricky, isn't it? I, I, it always takes me a bit of time to make a new place a home, even, right. if, it's, even if it's just for three months. But it's important to come back to at night, I think. Yes, definitely. Um, I... I I think I am very much a gypsy at heart. Right, okay. And I like... Now, at, at this stage in my life, and it may change, not having particularly fixed roots. Mm-hmm. Um, I like adventure. I like exploring. I am always looking for 
something new. Um, again, someone said to me the other day, because I think a lot of the people around me are more conventional in their kind of the construct of their life and lifestyle. And um, someone was like, well, you, you seem like you're always running. And I was like, I am, but it's not from anything to walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm running everywhere and every which way because there's just too much to try and get in in one life. And I want to experience as much of it as I can. Um, but then what I did start to find is when you do find yourself wherever, you don't have your people there, you don't have your tribe, you don't have your your familiarities, then you kind of have to start making home within. Mm. So I've been doing a lot of spiritual work over the last few years. And I tell you, I just had like an amazing two hour long guided visualization yesterday for the full moon. Like we do it every full moon, every new moon. And then I do my own rituals in between that. And, um, and so I suppose wherever I go, I have my little ritualistic things that I bring with me and that I do and um, that I can kind of get comfort from to find my grounding. And then from there, I can spread out and be bold and brave and leap for branches I can't see. And um, which helps you set foundations for however long that's going to be at yes. the specific home that you're yes. going to be in. Do you think, have you always had that nomadic spirit within? Because it's it's... It's very easy to adopt that nomadic lifestyle because of the very nature of what we do, because it's That's part and parcel of it. Chicken or the egg? Yeah. What, what about you? I think early on, I was running away. I was running away but also running too. So I was running away from the north of England to get to London to start trying to gain knowledge and be in, or well, certainly what I thought at the time, the city where it all happens right. at 17 years old. So I was running in away from something I didn't want to get something that I hopefully could achieve at some sort of level. I think that was my that was my thinking when I was when I was a late teen. Yeah. But I think I was nervous as well. I think I was scared because I hadn't really been part of a, a troupe before. I'd done a few plays, but you know, mainly sort of at school or amateur stuff. But I, I, it's different because you're not you're not part of a group that everybody has the same mindset right. when, when it when it becomes semi or, or, or full fully professional. Do you know what right. I mean? Right, 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 yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, okay. Mm. What was That's an like, interesting We can question. go back if it'll help because we can go back to school. How was how was your school life? And let, we can jump straight into secondary school because that's where everything sort of changes and, and we change. So I was one of those kids who bloody loved school. I did. A academically? Yeah. Right, okay. Lo loved everything about it. Loved my friends, loved doing sports, loved the opportunity to play a musical instrument, loved homework. That weird. No, no, you were just ferocious. Ferocious you, you wanted appetite, it all. yeah. I'll have that, that tastes good, I'll have that. Yeah. Have that, that tastes good. Brilliant. I did. And I, you know, can I you, was... Can very... you talk to my son and see if you can pass him? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Youth is wasted on the young, isn't it? If you can go look at all these opportunities, you can learn a foreign language, yeah. you can learn an instrument, you can learn to sing. And at the time, I just, I just want to go and play, see my mates. And by the way, this is all for free. It's for free. <laughs> Take it seriously. Yeah. No, I mean, I I possibly, I don't know how much of that is nature and nurture because I can sit here and say I've always had a ferocious appetite for learning and for discovering, but there was certainly my parents there, and you know, and as first-generation immigrants where they're, in, you know, very clearly showing us and explaining to us those opportunities that are real and that exist yeah, and yeah. you kind of go, you know, and I remember my mum saying it, this is a moment where you could, it can change your whole future. And if you just 
not for you, not for, you know, I did have a, um, also I still have it to this day, some kind of people pleasing um, default where I, I do want to make people proud and I do, I don't want to see that look of disappointment on people's faces or feeling like I've, you know, let people down. It's such an interesting thing. But yeah, is, were, you, was, <clears throat> were you like that at school or did you think that just became when you just, you know, became a professional actor? No, at school, right. definitely. And so my mum always used to be like, you know, you, you, you want to do it not for anybody else, but for yourself. Don't worry about what I think. Don't worry about what your teachers think, but look, do it for yourself. You are going to give yourself tools for a, a future. Yeah. And she was always really supportive. It, so when I was flitting around, she was always going, great, I'm here for you. So I'm like, I'm going to be an architect. That's fantastic. I wholly support you. I'm going to be a marine <laughs> biologist. That's great. I completely support you. I'm going to be a violinist. It just worked. Blah, blah. And I don't know, maybe I was even throwing things out to see what, whether she would say anything. But it was always just, I'm here for you. I'll support you. Um, and it just felt, I don't know. I really just enjoyed it. I maybe it suited my skill set producing product pro, product projects. I don't know that I could uh, be proud of and, and, and share. And also, from what you're saying, with your appetite to gain knowledge academically and musically, creatively, and you know, as a sportswoman, an architect or a membrologist, it could have been a possibility, right? If you'd have focused on on one thing, you quite clearly could have done it. I honestly thought I was going towards science for the longest time. Oh, did you? The marine biologist hung around for the longest time. And I remember my my teacher, Miss Oldham, and she was quite quite um, feared and, and strict. But we had a really good relationship and she would really support me as well. And I remember being entered for the higher papers at GCSEs. Right, okay. And I used to go and be like, oh, God, dude, it's going to be too hard. Mum was like, they wouldn't put, they wouldn't enter you into if a high paper. They didn't think yeah. you could do it. Mm. And I... Still a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure. But coal under pressure, babe. Mm. Diamonds. <laughs> I kind of like a bit of... Well, we do. What you just said earlier about that feeling of, you know, you're looking down. We make these choices. We've picked a career where at every single turn... There's an element of fear. Yeah. And I think we thrive off of that. Yeah, I do think that. Otherwise, why would we come back again and again, year after year, constantly being judged? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. No wonder my dad was terrified when I first thought I was going to get into this industry. Because for someone, uh, you know, from, uh, from the outside, you go, how? How can you just do that and then start again? Where's the structure? Where's right. the continuity? You know, where's your nine to five? That's yeah. not that's not how we work or emotionally no. click. Well, my sister said to me, well, after all the marine biology went away and, and I was like, now I'm gonna be an actor. Um, although that was out of the blue, really, for me. I remember early days she was like, But how will you be able to go to sleep every night not knowing where your next pay is gonna come from? And I went, how are you going to go to sleep every night knowing exactly where your next pay is going to come? I make a comeback. What's, <laughs> what's the age difference between you and your 16 sister? months. 16 months. Wow, so it's not that big a deal, is oh, it? We shared a room our whole lives. We. She's my best friend. She's the only person I speak to every single day, multiple mm. times a day. But our lifestyles couldn't be more different. What does she do? Um, she worked, well, she did a law degree, actually, at King's. She's so, so smart. Um, and I admire her so much, um, but we didn't have any money. Um, so it gets to the point where smarts just aren't enough and you, yeah. you can't afford to go to the bar and the next day and then it just all stops. Um, but she uses her degree now. She's amazing and she's uh, spearheading a lot of projects in terms of um, the industry, diversity within the industry, um, looking at legislation. And I mean, she, there's just a lot. Basically, all the good things. All the good, <laughs> good and the great. Yes, very much so. Um, but yeah, in, in the corporate world. Yeah. In the corporate world. So <clears throat> we've thrown around and um, flitted around architecture, marine biologists, the sciences. Yeah. After the higher papers, when 
did you flit to a possible career in acting? Well, um, drama was just one of the GCSEs that I picked. Mm -hmm. So um, we, I can't remember now, but you had your 11, didn't you? And mm -hmm. some were core and then some were your options. So I picked drama because I love the arts. I picked um, art as well, fine art. Uh, and then the drama teacher asked me to be in a extracurricular production of Antigone. Right. Um, and I'm, just a nice light comedy. Uh, like, very good, good, good. And I was like, I don't know, I got this dissertation to do. I probably didn't say dissertation. What we call it? <laughs> I got this coursework. I've been in America too long. <laughs> <laughs> I got this coursework too and I'm really busy. And she was like, no, no, but I think it'll be really good for you. So I said, oh, all right, then maybe just a small part. I'll play Ismene. And she's like, no, 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 I, I think I, I, like, I want you to play Antigone. I said, but that's going to be like loads of pressure and loads <laughs> of time rehearsals and I can't. And she said, no, it will, I think it will just be really good for you. So I did it. And I got off the stage and was like, bye-bye, dolphins. Oh, it's happened. <laughs> it's happened. Something just happened. Yeah. I think I'm going to do that. Yeah. However, then I picked my A-levels. And I think still at that stage, I wasn't completely sure that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with the arts because, as I say, that's a massive part of what I love as well as <laughs> the sciences. Um, so I picked fine art, English literature and theatre studies. And I completed those A-levels and then the time came for uni applications and I just... I went to a convent girls' school, an all convent girls' school, and I, I remember speaking to... And there were like nuns. It was run by nuns at the time when I was going there. And then I was talking to the careers advisor and I said, I, if I wanted to do acting, where would I go? And no one in my family does it. And she was like, I don't know. Like you'd go to university and do a degree. Right. I didn't know about drama schools. I didn't know they existed. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I don't know. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply to uni to do art, English literature and theatre studies. And whichever one, which application comes through first, that's just the sign from the university. And that's where you'll go. And that's where I'll go. Right. And then drama came through and I was like okay then that's a sign I'll just go and do that but in another world I am sitting with an easel painting somewhere I'm sure do you still keep that up yeah lockdown started me back did it that again god so it took quite a bit of time to start back yeah it was a big gap because then I was this was all consuming and and that fell away and then yeah sat there in lockdown and actually went to a friend's house who is a brilliant artist and I said can I can I just use one of those canvases? And he was like, you knock yourself out. And he was like, just be bold with your strokes and don't hesitate. Because <laughs> I was like, okay then, but what if I ruin it? <laughs> and I did, and then that was it. Went and bought all my own stuff and haven't stopped. How did that feel? Oh my God. For like the first time. Like seeing an old friend again. Wow. A part of you that had, has been away for so long. Did it feel nice to unlock that part that had been, sort, been shut away for so long? Yeah. Yeah, it did. And then you, because then you start having a conversation with yourself, going, well, why, why is it taking me this long? Yeah. Why do we not prioritise enough time out of our day for things that give us pleasure? But there is only so much, there's only so much you can do and, and carry on with to a certain degree and a certain level. But I suppose when the world stops... Mm. You know, I was talking to somebody, ago, you know, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into it because I think we've spoken about it quite a lot. But when, <laughs> when, it, when it unlocks or it awakens another part of you creatively, and not even just creatively, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. It is. But that's such a good point that you make. We can't do everything. And I think by that, for that reason, we do nothing. Because I sometimes say to myself, Oh, because I really want to get back into, you know, whatever, that that as well. I used to do this, I used to do that. And then you start overloading your brain and going there, actually, I can't get to classes to do this. I haven't got time in the day to do this. I'll get round to it. But I think if we just started one, like just did one thing for ourselves. Yeah. Just one, then it might... <clears throat> So you look at your kids or you look at children. I know they don't have to think about going to work and all the rest of it, but 
you that you kind of throw everything not at them but they have opportunities to like try this and try that and try this and try that and then as you say when we grow up and we lose the element of play we also lose that element of exploration and kind mm. of um i don't know and then as actors we find it again it comes back because we're forced to and we're, we're thrust into these new relationships with these people who we don't know but i guarantee by the end of the day we're going to know them a hell of a lot better there it is because it's the fast forward button on, on on friendship or not necessarily friendship, but certainly a relationship, whether it's a working relationship that blossoms into a friendship after a certain period or not, because we're thrust into that, we're forced to do that. Yeah. Which is, you know, you're talking before about how do ad- adult, as adults do we go, um, do you want to do you want to be my friend? Do you want to <laughs> do you wanna stay friends? Do you wanna, should we... Should we just, just have a chat and play. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> we can't do it. But we're lucky because that does happen every day. And therein, I think, lies the rub of, you know, you are saying, why do we, why do we continue to put ourselves in this place of fear mm. and uncertainty and anxiety and worry? Because the flip side of that is we get, we still get the opportunity to forge friendships and relationships and get exposure to to new energy and new creatives and and visit other countries uh-huh. that we would never never dream of going to so true there is a play that the play has continued yeah or, or re, been rediscovered mm-hmm. and i love it but i do you're right i do think there is no other um really maybe correct me if i'm wrong but no other sort of world of work where you are expected to trust each other so maybe yes of course if you're a surgeon and you're working with a team (laughs) um but that level of just um having to completely open and trust another person so quickly Mm. um and also start again can't we're constantly starting again yeah oh that finished and we go again but with a new team yeah new team new energy new goal new end line did you ever finish jobs and be like oh my god i've made like about five best friends we're all gonna keep in touch this is amazing and then go for that phase where you're like oh that- then it never happened <laughs> that didn't happen <laughs> of course i'll call you next week of course i'll call you next week yeah we'll go out and we'll do this now didn't call nothing no yeah of course and also i've been that person on, on the other end we always have yeah of course you've got a- but, it, but it, the thing is i don't take that person anymore and nobody else should because it's it's of it's of that time yeah it's of that moment it's in that cocoon yeah yeah and I think you are expected to strip yourself down, open yourself right up, just, you know, for the, for the very purpose of creating this work together in the most honest and authentic and beautiful way. It lives in its cocoon. It blossoms into a butterfly and flies away. And gone, yeah. And it's gone. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because how many times, oh, I think I don't see it as much, but certain relationships cross the line. And, you know, I'm just talking about people having affairs, basically. Or something. <laughs> and it's like, it's... That's not reality. Mm-hmm. You, it, it, you're, there's a smoke screen there. And then all of a sudden, when that clears and they come out of it, they go, oh, yeah, this, this isn't, a, it's not a real relationship, is it? Because we, we didn't see it. We were, we were um, we're blindsided by it all. Yeah. It existed, it was birthed, developed, and flourished in a land of make-believe. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't live in yeah. the real world. <laughs> don't take it home with you, kids, Don't basically. take it home with you. I mean, I don't know, we'll probably have people, like, commenting underneath going, well, mine lasted, I don't know, maybe. No, <laughs> but, that, but that just goes to prove that it was a relationship. Yeah. Born... Under a certain way, but it, what, I'm t- what I'm talking about is a fleeting affair. I know. You know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tell me, Freema, when did auditioning start for you? Well. I haven't spoken so, about auditions for ages. Oh, I find them quite interesting. I know. It's such a funny world. Yeah, I know. I love it. Um, okay, so I finished um, at secondary school, did that, went to uni, 
did the performing arts and then was one of only um, two people on the whole course that didn't do the showcase at the end. Why not? Because I wasn't sure it was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So you could opt out of, yeah. of doing the showcase? Yeah. So I have three years of studying and, you know, honing. And then they're like, right, we're inviting all the industry to come. Agents, cast and directors, get your headshots ready, print them out by the back and off you go. You've got your two contrasting pieces, off you go. And I just remember thinking, I think I think because what it was, I got there and went, oh, I had no idea there's a whole world or like a rites of passage of acting. I don't think that anymore, but that was what was in my 18-year-old head. When uh -huh. I was like, all oh, these people have been to blah de blah they've heard of blah de blah they've already worked with blah de blah Words that were like another language to me. And I felt so out of the circle and so out of the loop um, that I, I was like, okay, I'm already, I think, a few paces behind. So I'm going to use these three years to learn and and see what happens. And for a lot of people, I think it came as a finishing school, so what they yeah. already knew, and then off they went. And it was the beginning for me. So I did the three years and was like, I'm not ready. <laughs> You're not ready to jump off yet. I'm not ready yeah. to jump off yet. I can see how hungry these people are. It's terrifying me. I don't want to be even in an audition with them because I would just, I don't think, I think I have to know I want it enough. I have to really want it enough to go after it. And that's pretty much how I operate in every area of my life. I'll just like, I want, I have a sort of focus, I think about things. And I got to that point and I was like, mm, no, I'm not, I don't think I want it enough. So I left and I, I had a part-time job in Blockbuster Video all through uni. So I went and upped my shifts there. I worked in Blockbuster Video at Drama Did, School. Yeah. Why are we the same person? Crouch end. Very good. Strong, strong Tottenham stuff. Tottenham and Dalston. Uh, for those younger listeners, Blockbuster was a shop where you went to hire videotapes <laughs> of films. Uh, I'll be doing another podcast all about what a videotape is in a couple of weeks. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> and then the DVDs came in. Oh my, it was all I, I, get, I just gave all my DVDs away. They've all gone. They've all gone. Don't need them anymore. Had to. Did you keep one? N uh, no. They all went. My son, I kept my son, so I didn't throw his away. Yeah. He's got his. I'm a bit sentimental. I'd have to keep like, just a couple under the bed. We veered off. Let's get back to the okay. top, top and blockbuster. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, so I went. I upped my shifts there. And then, um, and then I would start. And then that was it. Someone came in from the course. And um, we had a little chat. And he said, what are you doing? You're not... You're not doing it. Because the thing is as well, I should mention after that showcase, I saw people running off the stage, quickly going and checking their 10 by 8s. Some people gleeful that all of, all of theirs had gone. Some people crying. Not one of theirs had been taken. And I was like, there's a lot of emotion in here. And I just, I just, I can't, I can't. So I'm going to go to a quiet blockbusters. So I went and then this, one of the guys from the course bumped into, you know, I don't know how many, a year or so later. And he said, um, what are you doing then? You didn't, you didn't want to continue? And I said, I don't know. I feel like I have more learning to do. Um, and then he said, well, have you heard of um, a co-op agency? And I, he said, do you have an agent? I said, no, I don't have any. I'm not doing anything. So he said, have you heard of co-op? No. He said, because he was part of this same one he was recommending. Absolutely brilliant. A group of actors get together, rent a space somewhere, chip in to hire equipment, a computer, a printer. We, we sit together. We have a name. And we are an agency and we cold call the industry and we get each other jobs. And I was like, are you serious? And he said, yeah, we've been running for years. They were called links management. Um, and he said, we, but the way they work is they look for demographics, right? We need one of each, they want to cover the kind of industry. Yeah. And they're like, we don't have any black women on our books. Would you like to come and interview? I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. I haven't really <laughs> done anything. And he said, no, but we're obviously all still, we're keen to have people in the in our community that are hungry, obviously, and want to learn and want to support each other. And it's that, it's just that. Come, it's a good place to learn. So I went for this interview. There was like 19 other actors sitting in this small room, no bigger than this, all like eyeballing you. Um, and just, we, we had a chat. We had a conversation. And I think... Um, they might have been impressed because that summer me and three friends decided to take ourselves off to the Cannes Film Festival under like and pretend we were a production company. What? And go and blag because we wanted to get to the screenings, see some right. of the movies. So we 
we got a big meeting with like, I'm talking, I don't know how we did it. And the guy knew we were like, he was like someone to do with Lord of the Rings. I can't remember. That's when the first Lord of the Rings came out. Yeah. We managed to get an interview pretending we were, I don't know, production company or something. And he let us finish and then went, you're not going to have a ticket to have tickets to the premiere, but I appreciate your confidence. And, um, and here's, and he gave us like signed photos of the Lord of the Rings cast and like gave us something for our trouble. Thanks, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, so he's like, you know, have that fearlessness. That's going to serve you well in this business. But, you know, no. So we, we left and I told the guys this story and they said, what? How? okay. So I don't know, maybe that helped me at that moment. They let me join. I made loads of mistakes on the phone calls. I would call casting directors and get their names wrong or just oh they love they love that i they love that. <laughs> some of them wouldn't like some would just be like what who is this phone would go down some were really open again like this guy they'd be like okay we're like hi we've just looked through um we, we just see in pcr this week that you're looking for um 35 to 45 year old um um female who is a we, we have what you need we have what you need and then they'd be like okay why don't you send them in? And if I tell you, Craig, I got my first job on tele um, through the co-op and then that sort of continued till there was a bit of a quiet spell and then I went back to Blockbusters right? Um, where it started to get a bit trickier because people would be like, did I just see you on Casualty last right. week? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, oh, man. So then... Um, I then that's where your family comes into play. I don't think I would be able to be to have pursued it if I didn't have the support. Support, yeah. My mum, I still was living with my mum, or my you know, laundry was done, the dinners were cooked, my sister paid my bills, my brother was my little therapist. He'd sit on my bed and talk me through, you know, why I was stressed about not getting this particular job. They were all there with me at every point, and then, and then things progressed, and then I got um, a commercial agent, and then. I was able to sustain myself off my craft. I mean, not only were you learning about the technique of auditioning, you had to learn a completely new skill set of going behind the phone and on the computer, hustling for auditions for all the other people other in the people. co-op. And you mentioned auditions. I got one so wrong when I called about one of the actors in the co-op, she had to go and do... So she was auditioning for The Graduate, mm -hmm. and they said... The stage play. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, we will need her to come with a monologue prepared, we'll need her to... Da -da 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 -da. And then she would have to be um, obviously prepared to move and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, right, writing all this stuff down. So when I called her up... I said, so you got your audition, um, you got to prepare this and prepare that, and um, and you've got to be ready to move house. Um, so, sorry? And she went, what? And I said, yes, because it's going to be a tour and um, and they, and they you have to be prepared to m move. And I'm sort of going, I don't And of course, they just wanted to be physical. And she, so she went dressed in heels and a tight skirt, <laughs> couldn't move. And I was like, this is, I'm getting, like losing jobs for other people now. This is horrible. Oh. Um, but auditions, I just, I don't know, man. Some of them were just painful. Oh my God. I remember there was one where it said in the script, she kisses the guy and I'm reading it with the director. And I said, I was like, do I, I mean, do you want me to, do I kiss you now or... I don't, oh, mate. Oh, man. Mate! <laughs> no, Freema. No, but uh, look, it's not nothing to do with me. It's not my podcast. But I've got terrible stories. I'll Go tell on. You. I know. Just I'll, give one. I'll tell you when we've... Uh, oh, I think I've mentioned this before. <laughs> and I was quite a, an angry young 20-year-old thinking I should just get this role. And I went in and the director couldn't be... It was like could not be bothered look kind of straight through me and it was like right okay re um do you want to do you want to read and i went yeah yeah fine. so i started the scene with the casting director and his phone goes off like a few lines in and he just turns it off turns his phone off puts it back in his pocket but he didn't turn it off because it went off another three times during the scene and I just went, I just, I might as well just give up. Everything was against me. But I think I just went in with a terrible attitude. But I don't think I deserved that. You know, I mean, no, no actor deserves that. I think they deserve a fair chance, you know? Yeah. It's just like that. Don't do that. 
Imagine if it was the shoe was on the other foot and we had our phone on. Oh, forget it. We would be getting phone calls. What are you playing at? Yeah, it's such a such a strange environment, isn't it? Because do you I deal with them better now? Do, do you? Do you feel there's more pressure on you now? No, because I I almost feel like. Again, with time and experience, you kind of realise that it's a mutual auditioning. Do you know what? You're one of the first people in five years that said that, and I completely agree with you. Absolutely. Like We have to want to work with those people. And also, you both have to know, we have to know that there's complicity between the two. Otherwise, and, and, you know, hopefully there's some foundations there we can build trust. Yep. Otherwise, how are we going to make the best thing that we can possibly make? 100%. So I walk out of there and if I'm like, that chemistry was off, then I don't want to work with, I don't want to work yeah, there. Yeah. It's not gonna, that's not going to work. I want to walk in being the, yes, the solution to your problem, quote unquote, as they say. But I also want to know that when I leave, I'm like, I can, I'm going to be in a safe environment to collaborate with you people as creatives. And, you know, this is very much a two-way street. So no, I don't. I almost feel like I'm the work comes secondary in a way it's a chemistry test to see if you can work with these people because you could have the best role in the world and if you are not in, if you're in an environment where you're stifled it's not going to be work that necessarily you're going to be proud of or that you're no, going to grow it's gonna, from it's going to translate onto screen and as we know most of the time we're sat around so yeah. hopefully we're going to be able to converse and discuss. Or yeah. what if there's a problem? Inevitably there is because it's always about putting out fires if there's problems. But what if there's no connection and we don't get on? And yeah. it's, we're just butting heads, which, again, could happen. Yeah. That's oh. so interesting you've said that. I can't think. When I don't get jobs, I'm like... Well, then absolutely. If, if, if it wasn't unanimous in that room that I'm the right person for the job, then if even one person was like, I don't want her there, then I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. go home and mourn the fact that I didn't get, because I'm like, that, that wasn't for me. That was not for me. And I know it's easier said, you know, if it's not, if it's for you, it won't pass you. But I genuinely operate from that place. But I think it's very important and healthy to hold on to things like that. Otherwise... You just get out the cat of nine tails and you're flogging yourself. It's always my fault and I didn't do this. It's like, let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Have you ever done pilot season? Uh, when I was living in New York for, for a brief period of time, yeah, I had it's exhausting. It's, I did it once. I did it once. And that was it because I... For those listening at home, oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, let's just explain what pilot season is. Um... Does it still happen? I don't really? think it does in that it's way. Not, not as what it was. No, so not as what it was. Usually it would be January. That's right, Jan, Feb. A lot of British actors would be going over mainly to Los Angeles. That's I, it. I was in New York, so I did a lot of mine from New York at the time, which is great because I kind of walk everywhere. Yeah. Um, and you sometimes you're on four to six meetings a day and you're bouncing around and you're getting sent the oddest things. You look at the page and you go, I, I, I could, they, they don't want to see me. If there's yes to do, go, go, go. You just fed in and out and mo most of the time nothing sticks and yep. then maybe some one thing does and then you have to go through the testing process and there's another sort of three sort of... Rounds. Round, yeah, <laughs> another three rounds. Anyway, yes, go yeah. on. So that's briefly, uh, rather crudely, explaining what pilot season is. Quite accurate, actually. Um, so exactly that. I got to a point where I was going in for exactly six or eight a day mm. and I remember after I think day two literally it was early I they give me the sort of lineup for the next few days and I said I did day one I did day two and I remember coming out me and my boyfriend at the time we went to I think it was the pink taco it was in there I went did it in LA right. and I went and ordered a huge bloody mary I remember drinking it and bursting into tears and thinking I can't I'm not going to be able to sustain this because you know, from the outside, people go, no, 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 no. Every opportunity is a good opportunity. Go, go, go. And I was thinking, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. I'm not going in giving the best of myself, giving good account of myself. What's the point? So then I said to my boyfriend, then I was like, um, I'm going to call my agent and say, 
I don't don't put me in for eight a day. And he and he was not getting that 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 many. And he was like, you you shouldn't like limit your chances. And I said, man, come on, it's got to be quality over quantity. It's got to yeah, be. Yeah. So I called them up and I said, I appreciate you guys. So I appreciate you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't want to do eight auditions a day anymore. I I can already. I feel shaky, and it's like I'm two days in. But it's also you. Just, you you don't want to, you can't. You, you physically you're not giving cannot. the best account of yourself. And you walk out of the room, that's the last thing they're going to remember. But I, I feel that about anything now. If, if you're not going to give the best account of yourself yeah. and what you can bring to the certain role, I don't go. I don't meet. Same. Same, same, yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said to them, can I go down to maybe just three a week? Oh, wow, you've gone from like eight a day to three a week. That's, I did. Yeah. I said, I want to do just three oh, a week. And obviously this was the American agents. Yep. Wow, what did they think of that? Well, they said fine. Then I didn't hear anything for about a week and my, my fellow then went, oh, God, they're probably well pissed off at you. And I said, I, why, though? I was just being honest. And then, of course, I think they just needed to rearrange a few things as the following week came there was my one, there was my two, there was my three. And if I tell you, Craig, I got studio tests, maybe like six or seven in that right. pilot season. Because you're able to be off book, mm -hmm. to play with it, mm -hmm. to do it inside out, back to front, on your head, and walk out of there going, oh, that, I feel good about that. Yeah, I did the best I could do there under that under that under those circumstances in that situation. Because yep. it is pressure because you, you're waiting around and it is like what you see. You're waiting around with other people in that room before you go in. Yeah. And they're still muttering to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> next year. I mean, it, you, we've seen it loads on, on, on films and it is the same. It's the truth. And you're trying to just, I just need to get into the right mindset and there's some other gays in action. Oh, shut up. How can you, how can you focus? That's so true. Well, smart thinking there, Freema. Cut it down. And hopefully one thing will land. I, you know, and again, and I don't know, again, it's different for everybody. Everybody works in a different way. And mm. I would never, so whenever I get asked, will you go and do talks or go to schools and talk about getting to the industry? And I'm like, there is no, this is my way. Like I did it this way and it worked for me, but I'm always loath to talk about the choices I made because if someone wants to mimic that, it might work horribly. Or it might completely, you know, totally backfire. But it will, it's, not your, it's, not, it's not your way. It's not their way. Yeah. They might work completely. So I'm like, yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't work that way. And I, I said to myself, if that means I've thrown my opportunities away, then I have to have the courage of my convictions and be like, stick by your beliefs. And that's that. Anyway, I, that's when I booked my first New York job. So that's the first time I lived in New York for two years. That was the Sex and the City prequel. Right. Carrie yeah, Diaries. Yeah. Yep. And I did that and then I thought, so from then on I was like, listen to, we're not really encouraged to listen to ourselves. There's so many voices around and it's like, you should do this, you should be doing this, bear that in mind, blah, blah, blah. But I think intuition, we can really, if we just increase the volume on that, it's been dialed down so low that we're just not hearing it anymore. And I, I'm trying to change that. Did you find it different working on a set over in the States? Like, I mean, I know they have a very strong work ethic, but sometimes I think they look at us and go, you told Schmo's doing it for that. What are you doing? But have you worked over there? No. no. <laughs> no. I know where my work is. I'm very happy here. I'm, <laughs> I'm 40 cents on Saturday. It's like, I'm too old to go over there and start oh, again. Gosh. Yep. No, no, it is, it's an interesting one, that, the difference is. I think when I went, first of all, from this way to that way, the, it was the, the things around me that I was noticing to be the difference, first of all, like stand-ins. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So um, for those listening who, and forgive us not being patronised, if you don't know what a stand-in is, Freema, tell ladies and gentlemen at home what a stand-in is. So a stand-in is somebody who is hired to stand in for you when the set needs to be lit um, and positionings need to be set for the camera. So you will stand down, your stand in will come and do all that and then they leave set and you take their place. I didn't realize that that was the case. So um, I remember at one point saying to this 
I've, you know, lovely lady at the time. I was like, no, no, you're all right. I'll just stay. I can stay. I don't need you because I felt like I was being a bit grand. Yeah. Because of course, because we're not used to it. it we're not happen over No, there. you stand where you're told, and you do what you're and doing, and you wait, and you line up, yeah. and you get you get the focus, make sure everybody's happy with the lights. Okay, and then we go, and then we go. But but there are people who this is their job. They're yes, what they are employed to do this. Yes, and I think I said. No, you're right, loves too many times and sent her on her way. I was like, go and have a seat. I'm all right. I'm not tired. <laughs> and then the, the first AD came over and said to me, um, if, 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 she's just a little bit worried that she's done something to upset you. And I said, why? No. It's because she's just not been allowed to do her job. And I was like, oh, oh my God. I'm so sorry. So I was like, yeah, no, we need, <laughs> I'm aware of this now. Also little things like, I don't know, having your name on a chair and, and the craft services being more food than you can anybody has ever yeah, yeah, seen yeah. Yeah. ever. And I'm just, there was just stuff like that. Did it, was it overwhelming? It was overwhelming. Everything it was bigger. And I remember when I was doing Law and Order, our tea time was tea and a tin of biscuits. Yeah, because that's what the normal tea time is on most sets. They come, they come around with a box of biscuits. Box, and you box go, of biscuits. Is there, is there any ginger nuts there? Because that's what I want with my tea. No, they're all gone. There's only crusted creams left. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll take those because that's free biscuits. Thank you. And I, and I need a bit of sugar at four thirty. Absolutely. So I didn't know what to make of. Do you want a toasted bagel with avocado, and smoked salmon, and cream cheese? And but I was like, what? Why? When? From where? How? How much will it cost me? Yeah. <laughs> So, so I've got my card. How much oh do my we, God. Is that, is he making, is he just cutting sushi over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he, that's, what, that's what he does. He, that's, he, we employ, I mean, it's bonkers. It's bonkers. But, you know, then you get to a set and you go, oh, a set is a set is a set. Mm -hmm. And thank God you get to know. I remember when I started on Crossroads, actually, learning things like, I didn't know what hit your mark meant. And for the people at home. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, um, I'm <laughs> coming after you now, Craig. You <laughs> Hit me. <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so hitting your marks, so basically there's a line on the floor or a mark on the floor that you need to be standing onto the camera. Can Otherwise, shot, you'll right? be out of focus and it'll look like a terrible shot and no terrible one will shot. see your face. So I didn't know what that meant and they kept saying it and one of the lovely actors, it was... Um, it might have been Roger Sloman, actually. He was like... Oh, what a legend. What a legend. Mm. So sweet. Mm. And I certainly remember him helping me with another thing as well, which I'll mention. But I, I learned, oh, you've got to actually stand on that line. There was another bit where um, someone said, we're just going to do a wild track with you, Freema. Everybody, shush. Everybody, silence. Okay, Freema. And I just stood there, like, eyeballing him. And he's nodding. And I'm eyeballing him. No idea. So just to explain to everybody at home, <laughs> again, so a wild track is a, a, a line or a little section of the scene that Save Me and Freema are doing a, a page scene. There's one line that they need to get from Freema. Everybody else stays quiet and a big boom mic comes into the front of Freema's face and she will say her line, the cat fell down the well. <laughs> and then they record that and then they add that to the scene and then that's done. There so, you go. Yeah. So... I was like, I don't know what's happening. And then the one that I do remember with Roger, I was doing a scene where a phone rang and I was going, blah, 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 hello. Um, and he said, they're going to have to add the ring of the phone no. afterwards. So maybe just like, if you want to give it like a little pause, there's a ring ring. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I'm like, so I was learning, learning, learning. So then you sort of get the technical things down, right? So then you go 3,000 miles away to a set. You're thinking, oh my God, this is so huge and big and I don't know what's going on. But then when you get onto set, you're familiar with yeah. things. I mean, of course, the bigger budgets, the more money, the more cameras, the more this, the more that. Um, so size was something that was different. But the foundations are the same. Yes, yeah. I felt so. Um, when it comes to like interactions though, I feel like I can be a lot more... <sighs> for, for, uh, I, I feel more comfortable. And this is not anything against big Hollywood producers. It's more the way I react in situations. Mm -hmm. But I, like working with Merman at the moment, I can feel so free to go and ask questions about the creation and the development and the marketing and the distribution, things that I would feel like are out of my jurisdiction. 
but now I kind of feel like so part of this product and this community that I have a vested interest in its life before, during and after. And I want to know. And I, I feel comfortable and confident to have these conversations with them because I feel a bit embraced, actually. I couldn't imagine going to like a huge NBC CEO and being like, you know, at the upfront. So what's your plan for the marketing and distribution of our show? <laughs> I would die. <laughs> But maybe he would have answered me if I'd have just asked. But I never felt that I could necessarily. And maybe not at that stage in your career where you felt you could or needed to. Right. But now it's kind of changed and it's different. And and I wanted to ask this because, as you know, you know, we don't tend to talk about specific jobs as such when I'm talking to actors. However, having said that... We hear about overnight success, like, all the time. And I've got a lot of friends who are musicians who are, you know, sometimes they're splashed on the pages of The Guardian saying, oh, they are absolute overnight success. Little do they know. They haven't. They've been absolutely grafting for, like, six or seven years. And you'd done bits and bobs before Doctor Who, right? Yeah. Were you prepared or did you have help when you were announced that this is going to sort of change your life and you're going to be in the public consciousness and also you're going to be thrown out to the Doctor Who fans who are, and I mean this with the utmost respect, a completely different breed. I mean, they're they're like a huge army of devoted, loving fans. Yes. Were you supported by that? Because obviously it must have changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It did change everything. Um... So when I, 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 I had a small role in the show mm. before I got the opportunity to audition for The Companion. And so I remember, I, I think that, that helped because I was only ever going up for a small role. But then I learned after the, after the event that um, because I auditioned for two quite contrasting roles while I was auditioning for that small role, um, they eventually got rid of one of the other characters from the episode, but I went up for both of them. Apparently the director liked that display that um, (laughs) that came from the audition. So they were already like, oh, there might be some people that we would want to call back later on down the line. So I didn't know any of that, you know. So that's great. I went and did my little job maybe wondered why some of the producers were coming down to sort of introduce themselves mm. while I was doing this very small role and thinking, oh, this is lovely. It's very friendly. Are people very kind Aren't they all nice? Lovely? They're just dead normal. <laughs> Great. That's what I all want to work with. Yeah. Nice normal people who just happen to make telly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then uh, that little role went away, I finished, and I left Cardiff, and then my agent got a call saying, they're doing a spin-off show called Torchwood and they actually want to meet you for one of the regulars in this new spin-off show I was like oh okay that makes sense that makes sense let's do it so they said we don't they don't have any script for Torchwood yet but here is episode one of season one from Doctor Who called Rose will you learn some of that and come and, and read with that so I was like okay sure so did that Met that same director. And then, of course, you got a shorthand, like we talked about. So you're already feeling confident and feeling good. Um, Got on really well. Um, Andy Pryor, the casting director, we're still great friends today. He's just delicious. Um, And then went through one round, two rounds. And then I think just before the third, they called my agent and she called me and said, "Um, So they've actually just been auditioning you for the companion the whole time, the new companion. I was like, oh, no, she said, but they obviously, this, this test is tomorrow now, the chemistry test with David. No point in getting nervous now. You've done all the work. Just go and see what happens. <laughs> oh, I mean, maybe you should have told me that sooner. Or maybe not. Or no. maybe not. Or maybe you not. Know? I so, think there's method in that madness, definitely. I think it's such a, I, again, I don't know what everybody else's entry into it was but that was just fine by me because I think there would have definitely been a pressure to overthink things yeah a pressure to kind of go wow this is could potentially be life-changing so I remember getting the train up to Cardiff with Andy Pryor it was Valentine's Day we wanted to go and get some dinner the only places we could go were like all decorated and we were sat across from each other like should we just get some fish and go (laughs) 
We laugh about it to this day. It was so surreal. And then I've told this story before. I got back to the room and David had left a little note under the door just being supportive and saying, you've come, you know, you've, you've come this far. Let's just go and have fun tomorrow. Let's just play with it. It doesn't, just, let's just keep going in the way that you have been. And yeah. Just don't. Yeah, you're going to be nervous, but we're all, everyone's here to support you. So I remember going into the room and there he was. It was a, one of the rooms in this hotel. Um, and then... And then we, yeah, it went really, really well. And then I remember coming away from there. I was working as an usher in the theatre at the time. And um, I remember I was driving. Someone, my agent called and said, can you just pull up a second? And I said, oh, God, all right, wait. So I said, go on then. And she went, um, you, didn't, you didn't get it. And I was like, what? What? Okay. Wow. I was like, okay, a dead dream and I dared hope. But, and I just got down to the last three free extenders like about the year before and I thought that was going to be my, my one and I didn't get it. And I was like, man, all right. Okay. I wasn't that cool about it. And I was like, but why? I think it went so well. And I, can you just call up and get some feedback, please? Don't often ask for feedback, but I really wanted to know. I was like, can you get it? She said, well, I, I don't think I could do that and I said but well, why she went well, because it wouldn't be necessary and I said why she said, because you got it oh. <laughs> I just was like <laughs> oh my god and the rest is pretty much a blur we did get a lot of support my family was spoken to you know we were spoken about media how to address you know the media side of things the fact that journalists would be interested in getting stories my where my mum lives on the council estate, there were people camped out there the whole time. My yeah. neighbour was getting knocked saying, how much would you give for that picture of her as a kid? Um, so it was, all that was going on, but I was sort of being protected from that because while we were shooting it in Cardiff, it felt like we were doing it in a bubble. Yeah. We were in a little bubble where it felt like we were just making this little sci-fi show just for us. And then it, when it came out, I was like, oh, it is a little bit of a big deal. <laughs> just a bit. Frame it. This has been so lovely. What an absolute delight. Um, thanks so much for coming on. It's been brilliant. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> happy nearly birthday to happy both of us. Happy nearly birthday to you. Have a lovely time. <laughs> okay, you too. Bye.